Second Samuel chapter 12. I'll try and concentrate, but I'm enjoying the singing. Um, now, this is, a, this is probably, well, you can read in the previous verse that uh, David married this lady, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
uh, and uh, she bore him a child. So that's all happening in verse 27. And then we get to the next chapter, which is chapter 12. And the Lord sent Nathan, who was a prophet, under David. Now, I don't know how long he lasts. Uh, the child is just a little child. We don't know exactly how old. Maybe 12 months has gone by. So David hasn't done anything about this for 12 months. I don't know whether the delay was for God to see whether David would do something about this, whether David would reflect at some point in time and recognise, well, this all came about because of what I did 12 months earlier or whatever time it was prior to this. But David didn't do that, it turns out. And Nathan didn't do anything prior to this. Again, I don't know whether Nathan was uh, waiting to see or... I suspect that Nathan, as being a prophet, knew what was going on. I suspect a lot of people were chatting and, and gossiping about what had happened because uh, in a very short space of time, Uriah died on the battlefront and David's marrying his wife within days almost. So I think that would cause a little bit of uh, sort of talk around the traps, I would imagine. As I said last week, some people might have thought what a wonderful person David is because he's prepared to take on uh, this uh, Uriah's wife and uh, look after her and shine because of one of his mighty men. But I think others knew better than that. And I suspect that Nathan knew better than that. And the time has come. The Lord put it on the heart of Nathan. The time was right. The word had to be delivered. The answer had to be given. And so Nathan was called onto the scene. And um, he, we won't read the story again, but he gave a rather interesting little uh, story there. Very wise in his approach. He must have been praying a lot, I suspect, Nathan. I don't think he's going to be fronting fun, fun, up to the king. The king had the right to say off with his head. At any particular point, he's alive, what Nathan was saying. Um, but Nathan knew he had a responsibility, and Nathan had to go and to tell uh, King David that he had to get his act together. Something had to be done about what had happened 12 months prior to this or whatever. There's always a catching up time involved here. And so uh, Nathan caught up to him, and he, after some prayer, obviously, he gave this wonderful story about a, a rich man and that. Uh, this rich man didn't treat this poor man very nicely and so on. And David listened to this story and thought it was probably true. He was going to have the, this poor man's, uh, look after the poor man at this rich man's head. Uh, in fact, it says he, he did something worthy to die. This was, this was David's response. And then in verse 7, having got the story, having drawn David in, David had already given his uh, judgment on the situation. The judgment was, this person who did that deed is worthy to die. The guy stole a sheep. He stole a sheep. And David is angry about this man stealing a sheep. And offered his head, you can't do that. This man's got no pity, no one's telling this poor, this poor person here. He's treating him like that. And of course, Nathan in the meantime has known that this man, David, has committed adultery and murder. Uh, and this guy stole a sheep and he's worthy to die. So Nathan says in verse 7, Thou art the man. You're the man, David. You're the man worthy to die. If you're going to go and kill a person who stole a sheep, which wasn't part of the law, by the way, that you, you didn't get to lose your life for stealing sheep. What you did was you had to restore it fourfold. But he was so angry, this guy was saying, This guy's worthy to die. He couldn't execute him because that wouldn't uh, be part of the law. But for adultery and murder, you certainly could be executed for that, no doubt about it. So uh, he, he had to go and uh, do something about this, identify this with David, and David had to be spoken to. Now, we want to somehow or other reconcile all of this. Now, David, by the way, there's no more words ever spoken by anybody else in the, in the Old Testament than David. He, he dominates. He's even mentioned almost 60 times in the New Testament, David. So there's plenty about David in the Bible. And if we look at David's life, how many times would we have used various examples? How many people know the story of David in the life and so on? There's lots of different things about David. And we know so many of his psalms. And people sing them and quote them. And, uh, and his life has been quoted many, many times. He was an amazing person in many, many ways. His life was full. I've, I've jotted a few things down here. Challenges, trials, temptations. Weaknesses, disappointments, sorrow, uh, repentance, joy, victory, praise, thanksgiving, battles, still waters, swords, and psalms. 
that's the mixture of this man's life. It was just a, an amazing number of years on the planet. Uh, but how do we reconcile his life and what he did on that particular episode? Well, we, we've got to do something about it, haven't we? And uh, so what happened was Nathan goes down to tell him and, and, and lays it on him. And after that, he, I won't read it all again, but he tells him what he'd done wrong, how he'd done wrong, what were the consequences of that wrong, uh, how despicable this was. It gave his enemies opportunity to blaspheme. It was a dreadful thing. So he called us by the spark. You know, there are many times when all of us, possibly, certainly pastors, have to call us by the spark. Sometimes what had to be said has to be said. And in this case, Nathan said what had to be said. And uh, he didn't know what David would do. He didn't know what uh, result he might have got, what reaction might have taken place here. But he knew from God that God's word had to be spoken, that God's will had to be done, that there had to have some consequence of all of this. As it turns out, he was going to lose this child. Uh, and maybe that's part of the reason God waited till there was an attachment. Seems a bit cruel, but that's maybe the Lord was teaching him a lesson here. And by the way, some people challenge what God does. One thing we'll find out here today is that David did not challenge God. Even after losing the life of his child, he did not challenge God. He knew he'd done wrong. And that's the significant thing here. He knew uh, what he had to do about the situation. So you read down in verse um, 13 when finally uh, Nathan says all of these bits and pieces here. And uh, David listened very carefully. And he says in verse 13 under Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I've sinned. There was no arguments. There was no uh, finding excuses. There was no blaming somebody else. There was no trying to vindicate himself. There was no justification, there was no anger, he didn't respond in any other way other than to say, well, we might have asked the question why he takes so long, but there it was that God was gracious enough to say, give this guy a chance. Go and talk to him, Nathan, and expose his sin for what it was, and let's see what he does. Well, what he did was, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Now he didn't just say he was sorry. That's easy to do. He didn't just mouth the word, oh, I've sinned. We're going to look at a moment, we've got time certainly, to look at Saul, the king before him, and the one he replaced, and see the difference in the attitude. When David said sorry, he meant sorry. When David was remorseful, he was remorseful. It cut him deep. He recognised in that instant of time and prepped for the rest of his life what he had done and the consequence of what he had done. This man felt it. He was truly repentant. He was truly sorry. He truly recognised he had sinned against God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And he had to get it right. He knew that. Now, he went on to write a psalm. We're going to read that in a moment. Psalm 51 at this particular time. And Psalm 51 is no doubt an extreme sort of repentant psalm because there was an extreme, as we said last week, act that he was involved in. I don't think we would ever, well, hope we'd never be involved in that act and we'd never have to write a psalm like Psalm 51. But somewhere in the middle there, we do silly things. And some of those silly things we need to talk to the Lord about and find repentance for our stupidity at times. Now, there's no excuse, of course. We can't simply say, oh, well, I did this, I'm sorry, let's move on, and we'll, we'll do it again next week, and I'm sorry, we'll do it again next week. It's, it's not, that's not the way it works, either. Nor is it the other one that we beat ourselves up all the time and we uh, wanted to whip ourselves. Because you look at the Psalm 51, it looks a bit like we've got to really be under condemnation for quite a while before we're going to get anywhere. Well, that's not the case. It, it's interesting that the forgiveness came in the same breath. I've sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said, not 20 years later, and Nathan said unto David, the Lord also put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. But he was going to suffer some consequences just the same. You don't always just get off scot free, even if the Lord does forgive you, of course. So the response that David gave, I think, is part of the reason why God would see him as one after his own heart. There's other qualities, but this is one of them. Repentance, true repentance, true sorrow for stupidity, 
truly wanting to get it right with God, but messing up from time to time and recognizing what he had to do. Let's go to Psalm 51. Perhaps that was the reason why God was prepared to forgive him. And it's the reason why God is prepared to forgive us too when we are sinning from time to time. God's love, God's grace, God's mercy overrides all of that if we are truly wanting to get it right. Can't just do what you like and sort of uh, implore grace to sort of get you off the hook, but uh, we want to get it right. I'm going to read a bit of this, of course. In fact, we're going to read the whole lot of it pretty well. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgressions. So David is reflecting here. I don't know how soon after Nathan came, he wrote this, but obviously he went into his chamber and he talked to the Lord and he poured his soul out to the Lord and he wrote it down here for a psalm for us to identify. It's extreme, um, but it was more than heartfelt. Wash me truly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Well, we know, of course, the sin, and so did David know the sin affected other people. Of course, our actions do. We spoke about that last week. Our actions do affect other people. He recognised that. Uriah died and his family had to deal with that. He had a mum and dad, I assume, and maybe some brothers. I don't know what he had. Anyway, there's family involved. There are other soldiers that got killed, and they have family, wives and husbands, and, sorry, and children. So there's probably a lot to deal with there. There's, there's a lot of stuff that went on. But what he's saying here primarily is, yes, I've affected a lot of people, but I've sinned against you. And that's the real issue here. When we recognise that our stupidity is really not about whether we offended that person, yes, we have to sort that out, or whether we upset that person, yes, sort that out, whether we behave ourselves inappropriately there, yes, sort that out. But really, the bottom line is we're supposed to be developing our relationship with God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And when we go off the rails, we offend him. And that's what David recognised. He recognised, yes, I've done a lot of stupid stuff, but the bottom line is... I have really been out of touch with God Almighty. And so he said, I have sinned. And then he went on to say in the same verse, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Since I've sinned against you, you've got every right to punish me and deal with me as you see fit. And I'm not going to argue about it. So there's no question of pleading his case and trying to prove that, well, I was under pressure. After all, perhaps he was a very beautiful woman. And, uh, and, and, and if you put forward a case that no doubt for various bits and pieces, as many of us can for a variety of reasons, but in this case of David saying here, I have sinned against you and there's no cause I can possibly plead on my behalf. You do as you see fit, and I will accept whatever you do. Simple as that. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and sinned in my mother conceived me. Now, he wasn't trying to find an excuse. He said, it's not my fault, my mother's. He was merely saying, this is my nature. Unfortunately, this is what I'm like. This is what flesh is all about, tragically. Behold, thou desire of truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. If you purge and wash me, I'll get some. I'll hear the voice of forgiveness again. I'll get some joy back in my heart again. And the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from my presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I think you can see why some people don't like singing that chorus when you think of the context of that chorus. And who it applied to and why it applied and what he was doing this time. As I say, this is an extreme psalm. Maybe we won't be quite as dramatic as that when we're talking to the Lord, but, but we need to talk to the Lord on a constant basis, no doubt, for some of the stupidities we do. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit, or actually in the Hebrew, willing spirit, willing to obey you type spirit. Then will I teach uh, transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. 
if you'll teach them by bitter experience. I'll be able to teach them a lot. I've learned a lesson. I'm teachable, and I want to be taught. I've learned a lesson. Uh, I know that sin has consequences. I know that repentance is required. I know that you can't get true forgiveness without true repentance. And uh, I want to be restored. I, I truly, I can, I'll learn out of this world. I'll learn how to encourage others that you can still approach the Almighty God and find that place with Him. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, or in the margin, bloods. More than just Uriah. I don't know many other soldiers died, but a number of other soldiers died with Uriah as well. All because of David. O oh God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O oh Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else will I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. He was the king. You want a thousand sheep, Lord? I can just order them up tomorrow. But he knew that wasn't the case. It wasn't going to be something that he could do in that way. It was impossible for him to make amends by promising something about, well, whatever his life might be or sacrifice he might do or what he's going to give up or what he's not going to give up or whatever. And he says here in verse 17, the sacrifice of God are a broken heart. The sacrifice of God are a broken heart, spirit, a broken contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Let me read that from the uh, Amplified. My sacrifice, the sacrifice that will be acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, broken down with sorrow for sin and humbly and thoroughly penitent. Such, O God, you will not despise. Now, I said this, I repeat myself. <laughs> That's extreme. And it sounds like we need to whip ourselves and beat ourselves in against ourselves against the brick wall and feel miserable and condemned. And no, we put them together and we understand what David had to go through, what David did. But I think there's just a general attitude. I don't want to make it sound like we're all doing things wrong all the time or we're going to find the sorrow all the time and we're going to be asking forgiveness all the time. I think what I'm trying to do is to develop an attitude that's ongoing in our hearts all the time. The, the nature of us will change. The nature of, of David is now back to where it should be, recognising that outside of God he has nothing. He needs to get it right with God. And so his attitude here that was acceptable to God was one who was prepared to be corrected, one who was teachable, one who was humble, one who was prepared to, uh, to learn uh, from his mistakes and, and move on in that particular way uh, and be prepared to be disciplined if necessary. He was prepared to listen to Nathan. You will see in a moment that Saul was vastly different to that. And so we're dealing with two hearts here. We're dealing with attitudes from within. I'm not talking about the sin. We'll all do stupid things from time to time. What we label them as is irrelevant. What I'm concerned about is how do we respond on a day-to-day -day basis? How do we live our life compared to the Word of God when we hear the Word of God? When the pastor speaks or someone else speaks, the brother or sister gives, how do we respond inwardly? Is our heart in tune with God all the time? Are we a person after God's own heart, willing to listen, willing to learn, willing to adapt, willing to change if necessary, willing to do what all that we need to do to pray, to come to meetings, to hear the word of God, to read the Bible, to do what is necessary to bring us in line with God's word. Verse 18 says, Do good in thy good pleasure and desire. Zion is just a terminology there for God's people, the church really. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifice of righteousness. And it goes on to say with, with other things. So you get it right first, he's saying. If I've got my right heart first, then I can expect good things from God. And then the service I put into God and the, the, and the mundane things and the day-to-day -day affairs I put in, the various approaches I make to God, they will be acceptable. They weren't going to be acceptable before. We could sacrifice a thousand sheep and there'd be no good to God whatsoever, no good for us. But after we're right with God, then a thousand sheep really means something to God. So you get it right first. And the Lord is saying to us here, have the right attitude first. Let's go back to uh, 1 Samuel. Chapter 9. Once I go back, go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. Chapter 9. Verse 4. Chapter 9. Verse 
Now, David ultimately replaced King Saul. He was the first, Saul was the first king of Israel. And uh, we're going to look at his circumstances. And his circumstances on the surface don't appear to be anywhere near as dramatic as David's. And yet, Saul missed out. And David didn't. Why? Because of the heart. Not because of the sin. Because of the heart. And so we read here in verse 15 of 1 Samuel 9. Now the Lord has told Samuel in his ear. So we haven't got Nathan anymore. We've got another prophet now. We've got Samuel. So a little bit ahead before Nathan and, uh, and David, we've now got Samuel and Saul. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul, before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and those who anoint him to be captain over my people, Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry has come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spoke to thee of, this same shall reign over my people. So this was uh, Samuel identified, or being told to identify this man Saul, and go and anoint him to be king. Verse 21. So Saul comes and Samuel speaks to him. And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribe of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore thou speakest thou so to me? So we've got humble beginnings from Saul. Looks pretty good for a while. In the beginning of verse 6 of chapter 2, oh, go to chapter 10, verse 1. Does that get him anointed? Verse 1 of chapter 10. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, It is not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance. So here you are, King Saul. And then you read in verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And in verse 7 at the end of that, God is with thee. And if you go down to verse 24 of the same chapter, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. It's looking pretty good at the moment. He yeah, can take a score now, and Saul's winning. And David's well down on this right this minute because you've got this wonderful setup here. Uh, there's a bit happened in between, but for the sake of time, we won't do that. We're going to jump over to uh, 1 Samuel 15. There was a little bit in between leading up to it. Saul did get ahead of himself even in the first couple of years, but here we are a little bit later. And uh, you know the story well, so I don't put well on it. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15, but I want you to contrast this reaction to David's and see why God treated Saul very differently to David. So verse 1, chapter 15, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king, we read that a couple of chapters ago, over his people of Israel. Now, right here, here's a, an opportunity for you uh, to act like a proper king. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Verse 3. Go and smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, <coughs> camel and ass. I won't take I won't digress to explain you know, the, the usual argument you get about what sort of God is that uh, that does those sort of things. But since the Amalekites were particularly evil, uh, then uh, we've got a bit of an insight of why God would not that want that to continue. Anyway, regardless of that, that's for the instructions. Do we have any problem with those instructions? Are they clear? I would think so. Down to verse 8. And he, Saul, took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings of the lambs, and of all that was good. I'm not sure whose judgment that was, about what was good. God said, get rid of it all, but they decided some of it was good. And would not only destroy them, but everything that was vile, again, that was their opinion, and refuse, they destroyed utterly. Now, quite clearly, we haven't followed out the instructions, quite clearly so. And, uh, even I can see that. And then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repents me that I have set up Saul with the king, for he has turned back from following me and have not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. It was like Nathan, I'm sure, had some prayer. Samuel had some prayer. He knew he had to confront King Saul. And maybe Samuel was a little bit more aware about how Saul was going to react to all of this. 
So uh, it grieved him that this man didn't do what he was supposed to do. Verse 13, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, hail, hearty, jolly good show. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Isn't it wonderful? It's unbelievable, really. And Samuel said, with a sense of humour, what meaneth then this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Since you're supposed to have destroyed everything, how come I'm hearing a few things that I'm not supposed to be hearing here? And Saul said, and Saul said, they, aliens, <laughs> mysterious people, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. No, 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 so What you were told to do was utterly destroy everything. Now, who's in charge here? He is the king. He is the king of Israel. Some of the people got under his guard and suddenly whipped all the way this stuff, and he didn't have any control over any of that, apparently. So, so uh, Samuel wasn't impressed with that. He actually said, in verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay. It's a real pity if you translate it properly. The word in the Hebrew is stop. That's what the word is, stay. It means stop. It does sound like a bit of the same thing, but, but only if you're staying still. He was actually saying, Saul, be quiet. Don't be ridiculous. Stop. Stop this nonsense. Stop this stupid talk. This is what I've got to say. So, verse 17 goes on to say, and Samuel said, uh, he, oh, look, at the end of verse 16, and he said, say on, all right, I'll be quiet and you speak. And Samuel said, when you were little in thine own sight, when you were humble, when you were willing to learn, when you were submissive, when you were pliable, when you were correctable, when you were teachable, was there not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and have you destroyed the sinners. So we see the death message there, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst lie upon the spoil, and didst even did evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Does he think or what? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. No, you haven't. You didn't come close. So, so I have obeyed the people of, I have obeyed the people of the Lord. And I have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Well, his own mouth is just destroyed himself. I'm supposed to actually, I've destroyed them all. That's what the Lord said, but I've got Agag here. What, what is he? Some, what is he? An ET or something. Where did he come from? Isn't he a Malachite? Isn't he one of the ones that's supposed to be destroyed? Out of his own mouth, he's saying, well, I did it all, but look, I took it in, so I didn't do it all. But the people took of the spoil. Oh, those rotten people. Sheep and oxen, the chief of the thief, which should have been utterly destroyed, the sacrifice of the Lord thy God in your girl. He tries to pretty it up and make it sound all right. They did it, oh, and they decided that they wanted to sacrifice. So you can't knock that, can you? They kept the good stuff to sacrifice to God. That's surely that's pretty reasonable. And it does sound reasonable, and we saw how reasonable it would be if we got it right first. God would accept the sacrifice that came from the right heart under the right circumstances. We read that with David. And here, no, 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 no. All back to front. He thought that somehow they would make amends. Somehow they would be an excuse. Somehow they would justify him. Somehow they would let him off the hook. Somehow they would vindicate him. And Samuel said, have the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken on the fat of rams. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is the iniquity of idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now that ought to really prick the heart of anybody. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Oh. I can't do this a bit better. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. What a pity when I was to say a bit more. If only he just kept his mouth shut then and meant it. It was just words, that's all. He was mouthing words. I have sinned. I didn't do what I was supposed to do. Was he really believing he sinned? Did he really believe he didn't do what he did? Should have done? 
because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Well, what did you do, Saul? You are the king and you're obeying the people now. So now the tail is wagging the dog. Then our place. I mean, Saul, Samuel got that with a test. And so did God, obviously. Intimidated by the people. Now, therefore, I pray that he says, Pardon my sin. So he's not looking to God to pardon his sin. He says to Samuel, We well, can just sort of take the sign of the cross over me or something or other and make you mumble a few words and I'll be right. I'll, off I go. And turn again with me, with me, that I may worship the Lord. We'll just get on with it. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I've sinned. Okay. But so what? It wasn't that big deal. They, they forced me to do I was fearful. Uh, they wanted to worship the Lord in their way. I thought, oh, that's okay. It's, it's reasonable. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. And in verse 28, And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbour of thine that is better than thou. And verse 30, Then he said, I have sinned, and semi colon, yet honour me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people and before Israel, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord thy God. Okay, well, don't, don't hold that against me. And don't let people see this, and I don't want them to have any less of me. I want them to praise me and recognize me and give honor to me and so on. So but let's get this over with, and then we can go back and face the people again. And uh, I'll be with you, and you'll be with me, and they'll see that we're all, it's okay, everything's all right. Yeah. I think you can see the attitude didn't work. It wasn't going to work, of course. This is not a man after God's own heart. David was, despite what he did, David was, deep down, a man after God's own heart. What Samuel, what the Saul did, you could argue was far less dramatic than what David did. But his response was totally unexpected. Totally. Uh, so it's not about the sin. It's about the reaction. It's about how we conduct ourselves, of course. So I've just got a few things here. Saul, Turned back from God, David sinned and turned to God. Saul was seeking his own fame and honor. David was seeking God's glory and God's honor. Saul wanted songs to be written about him, the praise of men. And David wrote songs about God to the praise of God. Saul wanted to kill David, and David said, I would not touch God's anointing. So we have a different response altogether. Two very different hearts. Both made dreadful mistakes, both got it wrong, but their vastly different attitudes made all the difference ultimately. Saul made excuses, David did not. David recognized and acknowledged his stupidity. Saul was full of justification. In 1 Kings 15, I'm just read it to you. It says, This is to, to Solomon. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, which is a pretty serious matter. So the Bible actually declares that as far as God was concerned, David was basically right and trying desperately to please God and wanting to obey God and wanting to get it right. The flesh got in the way. It was dreadful. Turn of events, of course, and the flesh was shocking there, and it's nominated. But the Bible actually testimony of him was David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except regarding the matter of Uriah. David's about silly things. Somehow or other, God's grace and mercy are just mind boggling. Now what would we think about a king that did what David did? How would we react to such circumstances? What would be our feelings? Well, when true repentance was shown and true sorrow was demonstrated and David poured his heart out to God, God's mercy overrides his judgment. Hallelujah for that. Because if that wasn't the case, we're all done for. Every single one of us. Because if God wants to exercise judgment against us, I'm sure you can find good cause to do so for all of us. But God's prepared to say no. If you've got a willing heart towards me and you want to please me and you desire us toward me, I will constantly be cleansing you, washing you with the blood of the man. 
the spirit will continue to work in our lives on a constant basis. We can always be right before God. We can always say there is now no condemnation if we're walking in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. I want to read just a, one other couple of, well, sorry, the time won't read too many, but there are, we, we could read a lot of verses from Psalms, of course, because uh, Paul wrote them all. Uh, in Psalm 78, it says, He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfold. From following the ewes, great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel's inheritance. So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and he guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So, as far as God is concerned, there's a lot more that he's pleased with about David, his attitude and approach, than this matter regarding Uriah and Bathsheba. Did we overlook it? Is God just bypassing it? No, God's judgment came down heavily on David. He lost a lot. I suggest he lost a lot of integrity, a lot of trust, confidence. He got his own commander in chief, not too sure what's happening. There's a lot of things that have happened. He also lost the child as well. He also lost other children. He also had strife all the way through his life. Because of this, it never seemed to work out. Even one of his own children rose up in rebellion against him and wanted to take the kingdom off him. So he had all of these things he was dealing with. Yet all the way through, he still wanted to get it right with God and still wanted to say the right thing as far as God is concerned. Let me just conclude. I've said, try to put a few points together. Overall, what we're talking, there's a lot more I want to talk about David, but not today. But this part of David was, Lord, I got it wrong, but you're right. And I want to be right with you. And I, I'm prepared to do anything that's necessary to get it right with you. And he, he wrote this in Psalm 16. I read from the Amplified. I say to, to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good beside you or beyond you. That's what David said. That, that's what his heart is about. Lord, outside of you, there is nothing. David said that. I don't know whether we're good at saying that ourselves. We occupy a lot with a lot of stuff. But David was prepared to say, I messed up, and outside of you, there, there is nothing. Really. In the same psalm, I've set the Lord continually before me. That's what his heart was. To set the Lord always before me. A little bit further on the same psalm, you will not abandon me. He had that confidence that God loved him, that God would look after him, that God would supply his every need, that he could trust God through his circumstances. You can't plead Psalm 51 unless you've got a God you believe you can plead to. You can't say what David said unless you believe that there would be an answer to that, that the God that he believed in, the God that he loved and trusted, was faithful to his word that he was a forgiving God, he was a merciful God, a gracious God, a loving God. He knew that and he wanted to restore that relationship. And then at the end of verse 16, Psalm 16, it says, you will show me the path of life. God will show us the path of life. And it goes on to say another translation, and the pleasure of living with you forever. You will show me the path of life now, and the great glorious future that we have with you forever. Willing heart, a heart after God's own heart.